Thank you for coming. It's still winter. So I could start with a joke and say thanks for putting up with the rotten conditions, but it's just getting to be kind of sickeningly old. We are uh, very lucky to have Dana Casperson here this evening. In just a minute, I'll introduce her formally. First, I want to mention one program that's coming up in a week. And um, as I survey the crowd, I think everybody is familiar with this building. The bathrooms here are, on, are in the basement, and there are not stairs. You have to go back out to the front, take the elevator to the basement. That's how you get to those. Um, not to steal any thunder from the program, we will be moving around in this space this evening a bit. Be mindful when you're near the paintings, if you are near the paintings, for two reasons. One, safety for the paintings. Number two, many of them that you can touch are alarmed. And if you just brush up against them, there will be a giant buzzkill. That is, we will stop our party. <clears throat> um, I want to say thank you to all the voters, those of you who are St. John's Bay residents and voters. Um, it takes a lot of support to run a place like this, and support from the town of St. Johnsbury is crucial. It's 20% of our budget. Um, we passed with a, a pretty resounding uh, percentage, so we are very grateful to the voters of St. Johnsbury. I was talking to Marianne Handy Harabi, who is in the back of the room. We were speaking about, we started talking about this program in December, and it took us a while to sort of jigger things and now we're here. And sometimes programs take a bit of work to, to make happen. And this one took that work. And it's all worth it. It's, it's going to be a, a terrific presentation. I want to thank, um, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. I want to mention this one program. A week, uh, next Wednesday, March 11th, in this room, Robbie Gilbert from LSC will be here. He's an assistant professor in the visual arts department. He'll be talking about gaming culture that is not bookmaking or monopoly, but online gaming, which has become apparently a big phenomenon. I know nothing about it. There are probably people here who know lots about it. He'll be talking about all kinds of things, the sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, gaming is, is fascinating. My son, who's 22, is a fast friend of gaming. Um, there are issues like Gamergate where women programmers are harassed because they object to some of the sexism in games that are made primarily by men. There's a whole range of discussion regarding gaming culture and Robbie will talk about lots of those things. So that's next Wednesday here at 7 o'clock. Um, let's see. Again, I want to thank Marianne Handy Harabi for making me aware of Dana's book, Changing the Conversation. There is a copy here in the library, and Dana has copies here this evening for purchase. Um, and Ariad made me aware of Dana as a performer. And this evening she was saying, this is a place where there are actually lots of dancers. I do some bookbinding myself. This is a place that has a, an oddly high number of bookbinders, which is just not something you find anywhere, maybe San Francisco, New York. So every once in a while, you find your place in the world that you want to be, and some of your like-minded people are, are there with you. And that is the case, as Marianne was saying, um, for her here. And it's become that way for me as well. There will be a reception after the presentation this evening that is sponsored by the Ned and Sarah Handy Fund for Dance. And Marianne has made that possible. So please stay after the presentation, and we'll talk, and we'll eat and drink. Um, the reception is being put on by the St. John'sbury Academy Culinary Arts Program, and if you've been to any of their events, to the Hilltopper Restaurant, you know you're in for a treat. They make terrific food, and we have four wonderful servers here tonight from the program. I also want to thank Phoebe Cobb and Diego Melendez from the Academy for preparing the copy. If you happen to read the paper this week, you saw a number of announcements for this program, and both Phoebe and Diego were responsible for that, um, and we really appreciate their help. <clears throat> To our presenter, Dana, Dana Kasperson. Dana is a conflict specialist, author, and performing artist. Her work focuses on empowering people to transform conflict from the inside, changing the conversation by changing their own actions and approach. When we were talking earlier this week, I said, how did you make the transition from performing artist to conflict resolution? And to, to sort of badly paraphrase what she said, life, you know, you have problems. You can find a better way to solve them. 
And she has done that both in her, her, her own life, her work, and now with this book. An award-winning creator and performer with the Ballet Frankfurt and the Foresight Company since 1988, Dana has developed choreographic work, films, installations, stage texts, and 30 years of iconic roles in the oeuvre of choreographer William Foresight. She has been a primary collaborator of Foresight's in creations ranging from the Inventing the World's largest bouncy castle for Art Angel in London to the development of internationally acclaimed stage works such as, let's see, Eidos Telos? Perfect. Didn't know how to say it, so just take a chance. And I don't believe in outer space. Since receiving her master's degree in conflict studies and med mediation, Dana has been creating events and projects that bridge her experience as a performing artist and a conflict specialist, using theatrical, choreographic thinking to enable communication in situations of conflict. These projects range from choreographic public dialogues to films to this new book, Changing the Conversation, 17 Principles of Conflict Resolution, and are being carried out in cooperation with communities, art institutions, universities, social action groups, conflict workers, artists, and other individuals throughout the world, and here this evening. Dana has received the Bessie Award for Outstanding Creative Achievement in New York, was nominated for the Laurence Olivier Award for Outstanding Dance Achievement in London, and has three times been awarded Best Dancer by the Ballet International Critics Survey. She works with individuals, groups, institutions, and communities to help them develop their capacity for courage and curiosity in the face of conflict and the skills to choose effective action in difficult times. She lives in Frankfurt and here in Vermont and works internationally. Please welcome Dana Kasperson. Turn on my mic. Okay, is my microphone on? Yes. Thank you, Bob. Lovely introduction, and thank you all for coming out tonight. I, it's great to see you here. It's wonderful to be connecting to the community in, this, in the Northeast Kingdom, where I'm actually moving here full time in a couple months. So um, I like to feel connected. So I am a performing artist and a conflict specialist. And there's more connection and crossover between those two areas of, of work, endeavor, and thinking than I originally thought. So conflict and performance are both dynamic, responsive situations where there's a pretty large uh, capacity for disaster. And there's also a very great possibility uh, for something new to emerge. So in performance and in conflict, the communicative situation is the work and is the point of possibility. And some of the questions that we run into when we're working in these areas are, what is the nature of the communicative situation that we're in? What are the mechanics? What is shaping it? How is the situation that we're in shaping us? And how are we shaping the situation? So I'm very interested in the question of how individuals can act to change destructive uh, situations, conversations, and systems from the inside. And I'd like to talk about two projects that I've been working on as a way of thinking about this question. The first is uh, the book that I uh, wrote called Changing the Conversation, which was just published last month by Penguin. And the second is a new, what I call, choreographic public dialogue um, that's going to happen next week. So this book is a very concise, highly graphic handbook for navigating conflict. And it's um, organized around 17 principles. And these are principles um, that point out 17 points of decision that we face in every conflict that we run into. So a decision between one action and another, whether we're conscious or not of the fact that we're choosing, we are choosing. So I'd like to uh, just read a little bit from the book. I'm going to read a bit about principle number one. So a little bit about the way the book is organized. It's each principle has its own chapter. There's an anti-principle for each principle. There's an explanation, um, examples, a practice section, 
And then it boils down to the choice. So principle number one, the anti-principle, here attack. Ignore all other information being offered. Principle, don't hear attack. Listen for what is behind the words. So the principle don't hear attack speaks to the question of perception. What do we choose to listen for in a conflict and how do we hear what is said? So how we listen helps determine not only what we hear and experience, but what is possible in a conflict. And cycles of attack, defense, and counterattack often dominate the action in a conflict. And this principle suggests that we step out of those cycles and change what we listen for. So it suggests that we practice not hearing attack when we're being attacked. And this is not a naive encouragement to put ourselves in danger or ignore threat. It's a call to change our own mental stance toward the person that we're in conflict with. So Don't Hear Attack proposes that we listen for the real substance of the matter. Instead of hearing attack, listen for what the person is really trying to say, even if they're saying it very badly in a way that you really don't want to hear that makes it very difficult to pay attention to what's actually important. So ask yourself, if this were said without attack, what would it sound like? So the impulse behind this principle is not moral. It's not about being nice, ignoring your own needs, putting yourself in a dangerous situation. Instead, it's practical. So rather than getting stuck in these unproductive cycles of attack and counterattack that we get into on domestic levels, at, at work, in our nation, Don't Hear Attack pushes us to engage directly with what's being expressed on a level that matters and that's useful. So obviously we're going to continue to notice if we're being attacked. The point is not to pretend we're not being attacked. Instead, if we're primarily paying attention to the attack and what people say, then we're wasting our time on a secondary issue. So listening past attack requires making a choice to engage in a different action, choosing a different action. Focus on hearing the why. So listening past attack is it's not easy. It often feels counterintuitive. It's the last thing we want to do when someone has come at us with something that's hurtful or confusing, hard to understand. But if our goal is to reduce the amount of destructive conflict and move toward a productive resolution, not hearing attack is extremely useful. So what this principle suggests is that we broaden our attention. Not, with, not that we narrow it, but we broaden our attention and listen more, more widely to what is happening, not just what's evident from our own point of view. So temporarily ignore the how and the what of what the things that are being said and focus instead intently on the why. And do this for both yourself and for the other, even and especially when you're hurt or angry. So here's some examples of what this might look like. I'm going to offer up an attack and what it might sound like if we were listening without uh, listening to something other than the attack. So an attack might sound like this. You know, what is the point? I'm not going to listen to you. You never listen to me anyway. So that would be something that would come at, come at you. If we extracted the attack and offered and listened for the information behind it, it might sound something like, look, I have something really important to tell you, and I want you to listen to me. Or, you know, if you cared about the kids at the school, you would not be going on strike. If we took the attack out of that, it might sound something like, I'm very concerned about how this conflict between the teachers and the school is affecting the kids. Attack might sound like, Mom, I hate you. You never let me do anything. Take the attack out might sound like, Mom, I need more autonomy in my life. So if we can hear what's inside of it, we can get more directly to the point and have a conversation that's going to get us somewhere. Or one final one, I do not want that woman in the house when you have the kids. Might sound like, I'm very concerned about how any new relationships we have might affect the kids. So as you can hear, the point is not that we ignore what the person is saying, but that we really try to get to the heart of the matter. 
And the, the way we can do this is by practicing, essentially. And getting used to asking ourselves the question, what if I hadn't heard attack? What would I have heard? So increasing our ability to make this translation allows real-time conflict to become less overwhelming. And it makes it more likely that we can access our own capacity for listening and demanding situations, whether it's at home, in the community, on a national level. This practice can help us have a better chance of hearing what's important and not just what's being said. So then there's a practice section. And so let's just, we won't really practice, but imagine you're practicing. Say the statement is this, you are constantly undermining my authority with the kids. Just because you don't have the guts to follow through on setting limits doesn't mean that the kids don't need them. So a practice would be to translate this statement by removing the attack. And it might sound something like, I think the kids need more limit set. I worry we're sending mixed messages. And I get frustrated and angry when you don't support my efforts to put some limits in place. So this principle boils down to a choice between two actions. And we run into this every time we're in a conflict, on whatever level, small or big. We're making a decision. Are we hearing attack? Or are we hearing information? So this book looks at how we affect and how we're affected by the conversations that we're in. And the power that we have to change destructive, situ destructive systems from the inside, regardless of what other people do, by changing our own actions. So in thinking about what kind of structures enable useful conversations to happen, and how we can be part of building those structures or unbuilding destructive structures, I've been developing a series of projects over the last few years called uh, Choreographic Public Dialogues. And what this, this means, these are public dialogues that use simple physical action as a way to enable and broaden the scope of a, of a public dialogue. So to choreograph means to organize ideas physically. And these can be ideas as in dance, as you might have seen with dance. You take, you take physical ideas and you organize them. Or they can be ideas in other realms. So let's just do a tiny choreography, if you're with me. OK? Could everybody raise their hand? Now on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lower your arm in 45 degrees in any direction, OK? So one, two, three. Beautiful. So this was a choreography, thank you, that was based on abstract motion. Now we're going to try another one. Uh, which way is north? That's north. OK, so north, south, east, west. Now think about where you were born. Could everybody raise their hand again? On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to point in the direction of the place where you were born. One, two, three. <laughs> nice. OK, great. So this is a choreography that is connected to and driven by your experience. And we use just there a simple physical action as a way for every person in this room to simultaneously uh, express something about their experience. So the choreographic uh, public dialogue projects that I've been working on use this kind of thinking. How, how are our bodies part of the conversations that we're having? How can they help us have more interesting conversations, m deeper conversations? How can they enable people who really don't feel comfortable, for example, talking on a mic, be, to be part of some kind of a dialogue? So the first two that I created, um, the first one was called Not on Not which took place in Germany. This is a dialogue on immigration, and I've been working on it for about five years. It's ongoing. I've done it in four different cities. I initially started it with my husband, William Forsyth, who is a choreographer. And since then, I've gone on and, and developed it in a number of ways. Um, and the second project I'm going to talk briefly about was Three Counter Movements to Violence, which I did last year here in um, the Northeast Kingdom, working with students from East Burke School, Learn, and St. Johnsbury Academy. And um, that project was a partnership between Catamount Arts, Umbrella, and the Restorative Justice Center. So it was a great project, and the kids were fantastic. So both of these projects 
create different communicative situations. So we're setting up some kind of a dynamic situation that tends to enable certain types of interaction. And here's some images from the different projects. So um, we're actually going to try this in a moment, so don't be scared. There's no dancing involved. This, they, in this project, this is not on Not in Berlin last year. I did it in three different parts of the city. We uh, recruited people from all over. It's, a, it's about immigration, so we try to get a really broad spectrum of folks. Um, and we're, and, and these, you can see the different areas of the city we were in. There's sections where people are moving throughout the room in response to their own beliefs about some of these questions that come up around immigration. And there's a section where people are seated at a table, four, four at a time in a very choreographed conversation. So one thing that happened in this dialogue is I've been working with uh, the Academy for Visual Arts in Frankfurt. And we've been trying to think for a few years. I went to him initially to say, how can I make some kind of a documentation that's not boring? you know, and, and not intrusive. How do you document this kind of an activity between people? And what we ended up doing in Berlin, which worked out, was really interesting, is we covered all the tables in ink. And then we covered the ink with paper. So as people were sitting at the tables talking to each other, they, were, they weren't aware of the ink, but they were leaving traces as they moved, they talked together, they touched. And so afterwards, these are the, some of the students from the academy. We took the paper off, we took a new piece of paper, and made a print. And what emerged were images like this, which is hard to see cl uh, close up. And, and these became fantastic kind of contemplative objects. So we would, right after the dialogues, we would um, pull them all off and lay them on the floor. And people would walk between them. So there was 100 people in each dialogue. So people would move between them, analyzing what happened through this mediated kind of uh, gestures, human gestures mediated through this ink. And it became a way for people to not only reflect on what they were just part of, but also to recode their own experience, to step back one step enough to, to see it differently. Um, and you can see here, this, um, she's writing the names of the people who are on the table get written on the side of the images. So three counter movements to violence I, I started working on last year. And what was fantastic about working on this project was that the young people were much more <laughs> flexible than I was. And so I was worrying about, OK, how are we going to get tables in here? I have to get enough chairs. They were like, we don't need chairs and tables. Psst. And so we ended up making this very fluid uh, system, which I loved. People were in, in motion all the time. And they had, everybody had home bases, so you can see here uh, groups would come together and then they would move back apart into larger groups and come back to their home base and move through the room. Um, and this project was on violence and it was very interesting working with the young people and their question, um, one of the main questions that they came up with is it was, is there a difference between the physical punishment of children and violence? which is such a fantastic question, and one that is so often unspoken on some level um, as, as we have children and they grow up and how do we work with them. So um, I thought that we might try a few things, if you're up for it. So ready? <laughs> OK, so these first questions have to do with immigration. And these come from the German um, project. So I'm going to ask everybody to put your hands out in front of you. And we're just going to practice. This is yes, no, maybe, or I don't know, or half and half. So actually, I'm going to ask you all to stand up, if you don't mind, and make a circle. So if we make a circle around the chairs. Thank you for your willingness. <laughs> There won't, be, there won't be anything embarrassing happening or no kind of audience participation, so no worries. <coughs> OK. So let's practice that one more time. Yes, no, maybe, I don't know. OK. So 
I'm going to say a statement, and then if you could just please respond with your hands and to each other. I was born in the United States. I think of myself as an American. <laughs> I speak the language or languages that my great-grandparents spoke. Hmm. My worldview, so the way I look at the world, is different from that of my parents. Hmm. <laughs> Religion is important to me. And this is interesting. This is a question that comes up a lot in Germany around questions of immigration. Thank you. Okay, immigrants should be required to learn English. <laughs> Headscarves, and this is not such an issue in America, but it's a big issue in Europe. Headscarves should be um, banned in all situations. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, it is possible for immigrants to truly become American. Hmm. Great, okay, thank you. Now, we're gonna try something that comes from, um, uses questions from the project from last year. And here, imagine that there's a big triangle. And we're gonna, for the purposes of this room, we're going to have this be section A, but over there behind the radiator. Behind the chairs is B, and this alcove is C. And here's the uh, pa painting alarm moment that we have to look out for. Okay, so now this is a, this um, this particular physical model is one that that lets us look at where we stand on issues. And normally in a project afterward, there would be some dialogue around why we stand there, just so you're aware what this particular model does. So these are questions about violence. Um, so I'm going to say three statements, statement A, statement B, and statement C. I'm getting some feedback here. Oh, it's from the speaker. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, I'll say statement A, statement B, statement C, and ask you to walk to the place that it makes the most sense to you in terms of the statement, OK? Um, thank you for dealing with the chairs and stuff. So here we go. A, violence is part of human nature. B, violence is learned behavior. C, I don't know. So violence is part of human nature. It's learned behavior. I don't know. And you might end up straddling a zone, you know, because it's not always so clear. Great. Um, so, A, I know someone who has experienced violence. B, I don't know anybody who has experienced violence. C, I prefer not to talk about that. So, I know someone who has experienced violence. I don't know anyone. I don't want to talk about that. What? Okay, lots of violence. Okay, great. So violence is A, a form of justice. B, violence is never just. C, I don't know. Violence is a form of justice. It's never just. I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay. Violence, uh, sorry, the death penalty is a form of violence. The death penalty is not a form of violence. I'm not sure. Yes, the death penalty is a form of violence. The death penalty is not a form of violence. I'm not sure. So tricky questions, thank you for considering them. Okay. The death penalty is acceptable. The death penalty is not acceptable. I don't know. So the death penalty is acceptable. It's not acceptable. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. OK. And spanking is a form of violence. Spanking is not a form of violence. I don't know. Spanking is a form of violence. It's not a form of violence. I'm not sure. <laughs> Are you in between? Yeah. <laughs> it's not so easy to decide that one, I know. Okay, great. Spanking is acceptable. Spanking is not acceptable. I'm not sure. Spanking is acceptable. It's not acceptable. I'm not sure. I was doing this, I did this question with a bunch of mediators. And they all kind of stood in the middle and they were like, how much do we not want to answer this question? <laughs> so <laughs> this is not an easy question to answer. There's certain qualifications. Yeah, yeah there is for all of these. Yeah. That's why there's a big qualification here. Yeah. Yes, exactly. There's always qualifications in this. It's interesting how you, all, you know if you stand in the middle, you know if you stand on one side, but it's not always so. Yeah. OK, thank you. So um, A, most of what I believe about handling conflict, I learned from my family. B, most of what I know about, what I believe about dealing with conflict, I learned at school. Most of what I know, what I believe about dealing with conflict, I learned somewhere else. So from the family, school, some other source. <coughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay. It's actually kind of amazing how how few of us learn anything about conflict at school. I mean, it really is. I think about that a lot. I didn't learn anything about conflict in, in you know grade school or anything. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, last one. A, I think it is possible to substantially reduce the amount of violence in the world. B, I don't think we can really do anything about it. C, I don't know. I think we can do something about reducing violence in the world. We can't do anything about it. I'm not sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Qualifications. <laughs> right. Off, off in the middle. Yeah. So some people are in the middle. They're saying there's certain things that seem. You mentioned ISIS. Yeah. What, what qualification are you thinking about? Not really. I mean, just there's 
so many variables to that. Yeah. So kind of, yeah. Poetry. Poetry. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. So please take your seats again. Okay, thank you so much for being willing to uh, engage in that. So in that, if you're in that project, you might move through 20 or 30 series of those where you're asked to take a literal stance on your belief. And you find yourself um, group here, standing here means this, standing there means that. Now you find yourself with these people, then you find yourself across the line, straddling the line. It starts to get more and more confusing as you started to also express that these questions that we don't always consider uh, so much consciously are so complicated and yet we feel them, we feel our responses in our bodies, we know where we stand on some level. Um, and so what I, what I like about working with the body is that um, not only is everyone involved, but, every, but, every, but your actions have meaning. So you're automatically answering whether you move or not, for example in this instance, your, your body can never not be. So it's like, um, it's a way for us to make visible our thoughts as a group without having to have endless conversations and you know, pass around the microphone and, and those kind of things, which can also be very useful, but aren't always, uh, aren't always the strongest way to, to do something. So my latest project is called Violence Recode. And this is an international series of uh, choreographic public dialogues on violence that I'm starting out. And so far, we're, we're planning to do it in Boston, London, Dresden, Frankfurt, and some other cities that are coming. And uh, the very first event of Violence Recode is happening here in the Northeast Kingdom next Wednesday at Linden State College. Pat Shine from Linden State College invited me to come and um, create a project with the students there. And what I'm really excited about with this project is we're going even further toward um, using the physical as a way to think about, um, in this instance, structural violence. So destructive systems like racism and sexism, systems that create avoidable harm. And so what we've been working on is finding ways to use actions like, just super simple actions like sitting and standing as a way to, um, to think about and expand the conversation around uh, these difficult topics. So in this project that's coming up, there's no dancing, there's no performance, there's no audience, there's nothing embarrassing. Um, there is drumming. This is a new, <laughs> something we just, I just started working this week with one of the teachers there and his students, so there's 20 drummers. And um, we're, we're still pulling it all together. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens. And I'd like to invite all of you to come and bring your friends. It would be great. It's next Wednesday at 6 in the Standard Gym at Linden State College. Um, so I've, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to work with these students and to engage with the community here to find ways to, to think about these things that are affecting us, that affect St. Johnsbury, that affect all of our communities, the young people, people who move up here. Um, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to have had the chance to share my work with you tonight. Thank you so much for, for coming. And I'd like to if, uh, turn the floor over to you if you have any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to talk about. And but just before we do, I wanted to thank the Athenaeum so much for hosting this event. This has really been lovely to have this opportunity. I want to thank the St. Johnsbury Academy and Catamount Arts for sponsoring this event. And a special thanks to Marianne Haraibi for initiating and organizing this event and also for, for your strong, sustained engagement, not only with the dance community, but with the community at large. I really appreciate your support. So um, 
Yeah, so I'd like to, if anybody has any questions or any comments, I'd love to hear what you're thinking. Yeah. How, <coughs> how and why did you get into this? The question was how and why do I, how did I get into this, yes. So I've been a performing artist for 30 years, a professional, and so I've worked, um, I, I've worked with a lot of different people, and at a certain point in my life, I encountered somehow a whole bunch of conflict in my personal life, in my work life, and I just reached a point where I thought, there has just got to be a better way to deal with than I know. And actually, a friend of mine dragged me to a, a workshop with Marshall Rosenberg. I don't know if anybody you know him. Yes, who? Yes, from Nonvalid Communication. I didn't know who he was, and I had this, this a moment of kind of epiphany listening to him. I felt this possibility. And, and then I started moving towards it and thinking, OK. And then eventually I went and got a master's degree at Woodbury College. Um, this man here is a good friend of one of the most wonderful teachers there, <laughs> Alice Esty. And, um, and I became more and more fascinated the more I learned about it and the more I started to see how much possibility unfolds um, when people develop a different approach to conflict. Yeah. Yes? Dealing with domestic violence can cause brain injury. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, uh, uh, you, know, if you started out with this uh, listening to what somebody's saying and hearing what they're actually saying. Yeah. You know, because it would be nice if we could see you do something that you could de-escalate something before it gets to out of control. So yeah. Maybe you just have a little play with that and kind of interesting to say. You mean like what, what to do so we can avoid getting yeah. to the place? I know there's body language, you know, just a facial thing, and uh, so there's lots of different things they can, uh, people are watching the other individual. I'm just wondering if you had anything to say about how you de-escalate something before it gets into because you'll notice that a whole bunch of people got over here when they talked about violence. And yeah, so much violence. That kind of thing. Yeah, so that's a great question. So how do we, how do we act preemptively? And, um, and this is what I'm really interested in because we cannot change anybody else. We often can't change our situation, but we can practice on a daily level, and this is what I... Um, this is my hope with this book, too, is that it, it provides a way to practice for individuals, to develop the capacity to, when something starts to happen, to shift direction in ourself. So rather than trying to get someone else to do something, shift our direction so that the, the um, direction of the conversation itself is more likely to shift. Um, that's a great idea, though, to find a physical way to, to practice those things. Um, I think I, we need a little more time to do something really substantive along that, but a, that's a, a really good question, and um, I'd love to work on it in some other format. Yeah. Thank you. Uh huh. Uh, I'm curious with the exercise that we just did, if there is a, typically a conversation prior to or following around the definition of violence. Mm. So the question was with the, you mean this moving one? Yeah. Was, is there a definition of violence, a conversation about that in relationship to this? Um, oftentimes I will say, uh, and, and oftentimes I actually wait until it comes up because people do start to say, but I, what, you know? And it, I find that it tends to be more helpful to wait until people encounter the friction, um, but rather than me saying, you know, because I don't know what people, actually, and that's one of the questions that the kids came up with last year is, what's your definition of violence? And people had widely varying opinions about that. Um, and so I, I tend, I mean, in my work in general, I tend to uh, t not try to be the one who decides what is anything, because I don't know. But to, to open up a dialogue, and, and um, that was the first question we asked in, uh, the, the dialogue last year was, what is your definition of violence? So there was a, a first conversation about that. Because everything, everything, all of your movements are based on your own experience and what your belief about violence is. And people, what, what some people think is violence, what I think is violence, I encountered a lot of people who say that's not violence, that's just 
um, child rearing or that's just um, the law and punishment. So um, that's a really great question, yeah. Yeah. Your first principle, as you were describing you know, with those different examples, sounds a lot like kind of reframing and sort of changing a pronoun instead of you are doing something wrong. It's we have an issue we have to sort out. Is that the technique you're suggesting that we try and practice? Well, so reframing certainly involves not hearing attack. What I've tried to do in this book is, is um, step away from kind of jargony things like reframing because a lot of times they, they can feel clunky when people get into a real situation. So I've tried to break it down to actions. What are we doing? Are we listening to the attack that the person is saying, or are we not listening to the attack? Because a lot of times the attempt to reframe, it, it takes a lot of practice, but the practice of just saying, okay, am I listening to what the attack they're saying, or am I listening for what their information is a more basic level that we can practice. Um, and so not hearing attack is part of reframing, but I wouldn't say that um, that not hearing attack is reframing necessarily. I didn't mean to get hung up on the reframing. Yeah. Part, right? and are you suggesting that if we're trying to learn not hearing attacks, we mm -hmm. learn how to articulate the problem in a way that's more inclusive? So we have an issue that we have to deal with rather than you have a problem with the way you're hearing kids. Yeah, so, th so that's another, um, another one of the principles is um, acknowledge conflict. So how do we acknowledge a conflict in a way that doesn't escalate it or suppress it? So rather than, for example, saying, um, you know, you're such a slob, you just expect me to do, you never do anything around the house. If I, if I would instead, as you say, offer up the problem in a way that nobody would have any problems with as, as a way for us to have a ground on which we're talking, I might say, I'd like to talk about how we're dividing household tasks. So yeah, it is, a, it is a form of reframing. And essentially, all of these principles come together to help us reframe a situation to take a new stance, a new mental stance toward what's happening and, and toward the person and, and what they're saying. Because in a conflict, everyone is trying to talk about something that's important to them, even if they're doing it in a really terrible way. And so if we can get used to refocusing our attention on the information and being able to articulate it, then we'll have a much better chance of having a useful conversation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Could you explain a little more about your project in Germany? Mm -hmm. uh, was it one that you initiated or you were called in to help a community address the issue? Hmm. So the question is, was I called in to help with that uh, German project or was it self-initiated? Actually, that project, <coughs> excuse me, was um, there's a, a bank, the B BHF Bank in Frankfurt has a, a social action uh, project where they invite artists to create social action projects. And so they invited my husband and I to do something. And we, it was at the time when this book came out called um, Germany does away with itself. Deutschland schafft sich ab. And it was about, um, it was this very extreme right uh, person talking about how Germany was destroying itself by having too many immigrants. And so we were thinking about immigration as a form of choreography, as this motion of belief, motion of experience in the people. And, and so we, uh, we started to uh, develop this project and then we pulled the community in. So that project um, was actually a commission. And then after that, I started developing it further and uh, took it to different cities. And then I initiated myself. So I contacted, no, actually the second one, I was contacted by the city, um, by a, a, a development corporation actually, who works also socially. <clears throat> and they invited me to Raunheim. And then in Berlin, I initiated myself and I found partners. And um, this project in, in last year, I also initiated myself and then found partners, um, which is nice. It's nice to be free and then find the partners who are connected to the ideas. Yeah. Uh -huh. So does your technique um, presume that the parties um, 
can be reasonable. Mm. <laughs> and, and, and if they can't, if, if one partner or both of the parties yeah. are really incapable of being reasonable, mm -hmm. how do you understand that? How does, how does your approach work there? So the question is, what if one of the people is totally unreasonable? Then what do you do? And <clears throat> the, the thing is that we don't know what's possible in a conflict. A lot of times we have a lot of assumptions about what that person is capable of or you know, what might be possible at all in the situation. So for me, one of the first, instance, <clears throat> the first uh, steps is to take the stance that, all right, if it were possible to have a decent conversation right now, what would need to happen? And a lot of times, that kind of a question can help a person who, that, you know, if we're thinking, this is totally unreasonable, if they can't talk to him. But he's like that for some, some reason, unless there's some mental illness problem or something like that. People are stuck on their um, particular strategy for a reason. And if we can open up the conversation enough to say, look, you know, obviously this is not going well. What, what would need to happen in order for us, first of all, to have a conversation, and people often know what they would need. Well, you'd have to do this. OK, so you're thinking we would have to have more of this kind of a thing. So it, for me, it's about unpacking the conflict. So it's not just this big ball of stress that we're fighting against or, or running away from, but saying, all right, what is, let's first of all, what's going on here? And asking the other person, even when we think we already know, even when we don't really want to hear them, we need them. Uh, to solve any conflict. We need their information. So to be willing to say to the person, OK, I, I need to understand better what's going on for you. It looks like you're furious. It looks like you don't even want to be here. Um, can you just tell me what's the most important thing for you in, in this? And start to bring up the information that they care about. And be willing to look at it in a way that is not hearing the attack that's probably coming at you, but saying, OK, I want to see if I understand this correctly and ask questions. Is it that you care about this? Because if we guess wrong, people always know. They'll say, no, it's not that. It's this. Oh, OK. Is it this? So how do we get at the information? So, rather, so stepping away from the idea of the other person being impossible and coming back to, always coming back to ourself and our, our willingness to listen for what matters. And the hope, my hope with this book is that these, taking it down to this level of different actions, so becoming conscious of, am I choosing to talk to the person's worst self? And this, one of the principles is talk to the person's best self, for example. So rather than saying to someone, you know, I don't even bring things up with you anymore because you're incapable of accepting feedback. Then we're provoking their worst self. We're engaging it, getting it for sure going to fire it up. But if we step back and say, OK, if this person and this is a practice that we need to do. If, I, if this was like a totally reasonable person, how would I say this to them? I might say, you know, when I have feedback for you, what's the best way for me to offer it to you? And that's going to make it much more likely that the person is going to respond better. And there might be some instances where it just goes horribly wrong, and then you need to go to the courts or whatever. But but many, many conflicts are unnecessarily destructive, in my experience. <laughs> but, yes? So um, I'm curious about the goal or the purpose. Like, what does he mean like, by what we did earlier? Like, uh, like, safety and safety of being of sea. Um, excuse me. <coughs> Wait. It's not a cold. So the question was, what is the goal of that kind of thing that we just did with the triangle? <coughs> excuse me. I have to put some water. I have this cold. I've had it for like a week. So the goal is, for example, to enable a dialogue on immigration or on violence. <clears throat> and to do it in a way that everybody is involved and that we start to look at these complicated issues and we use the body so that, for example, now everybody in the room responded and saw what everybody else thought without people having to talk. 
And <clears throat> it's a way to make things visible in a, in a concrete way. So it, we're, it's literally visible in our bodies. And to make, um, because belief is so, it's so important in our, in our um, it, it shapes everything we do, but often we're not so conscious of how it's shaping it. And this is one way for it to become very concretely evident. And then it tends to create a good ground where people can talk. So normally there would be um, some kind of a very controlled conversation after. For example, in the <clears throat> German project, there's four people at a table. There's, a, there's 25 tables, four people at a table, and it goes around. Uh, we ask, I, I think, six questions. Each person has a minute or two minutes or whatever to speak. Everybody else just listens. And so it creates... Um, the, the tension that comes up in this kind of triangle situation where people feel also there's, you know, there's these in-between things, I don't know, and it's complicated, then comes out in the conversations more strongly. A lot of times, because the first time I did this project, actually, it didn't, totally didn't work because I, I was scared about, I was nervous about using physical stuff, so I didn't really do anything. And I had people sit at tables, and it was complete. It was totally stiff, and uncomfortable, and people hated it. And then I was like, "All right, that did not work." And so the next time, I just uh, tried all kinds of things out, and it and it, it had such a lively effect because people, because we are physical beings, and we live through our bodies, and to find ways to let our bodies be part of this conversation makes the energy in the room come up and makes these dialogues much, much more flexible. Yeah? Um, one of the interesting things for me in having participated is that we were all in the neutral zone. There were, there were no overtones. We, we didn't have the intonation of voice or a word choice. And so the one common denominator is that we were all just physically moving from space to space without an, an overtone of emotion or dynamic or aggravation. And that in itself was calming and a, a gateway into developing a, a, a relationship with each other. Mm. Yeah, so the comment that taking language out of it pr provides, on some level, more like a skeletal uh, look at, at our beliefs and our stance around these issues. Yeah. Well, a neutral physicality. A neutral physicality, yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, do conflicts get settled by um, just physical interaction, or are there words that need to be eventually said in order to resolve conflict? Because mm. I mean, you're talking about the physical dynamic, and conflict usually is very verbal. So how do you? Yeah. I'm just wondering how you marry the two. Right. So so this these physical practices I'm using in public dialogue pro processes. And because in public, you know, the public debate, for example, on immigration or on um, race in the states right now, and these things tend to happen up on the level of, of strategy and um, attack. And much less often do we talk about experience and um, uh, unpack it that way. So for me, these dialogues, this physicality in the dialogues is a way of creating more motion, more flexibility in the interactions that people have. In conflict itself, I mean, and so that's a way of approaching a, a societal conflict and a way of creating maybe more space around a dialogue. If we're dealing with a specific conflict, I, I've never seen a conflict be resolved just physically, but maybe there is a way. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, and I, I didn't mean like physically, like with violence or Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Just, uh, I don't know, just by interacting. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a great question that I'm thinking a lot, too, about because as I teach, for example, conflict workshops, my, ex my experience is that when people, um, people feel physically the difference between different ways of responding, for example, reframing, if, if you say something in a way that is, is an attack, people sense it physically immediately. If you say it differently, they feel it. And so I've been also working with trying to find ways to um, help to let the body help us understand internally how to get at these more useful ways of, of talking to each other. 
without becoming formulaic, because there's just nothing worse than a terrible, you know, formulaic response. Do you think that, um, um, I forgot his name, who, who's the gentleman who wrote? Marshall uh, Rosenberg? Yeah. Do you think that his, his um, techniques, or I don't even like to call them techniques, but his way of resolving conflict is, um, tends to be like that? Tends to be uh, formulaic? I think that um, I think that at the root he's a radical. Yeah, I really do. I actually have a yeah. yeah, I think that, um, and I was actually went to a workshop one time with him, and I heard him saying that he said if one more person comes up to me and says, "When I hear you say I feel I'm going to die," and and so he also recognized it, and because that sentence, you know, when this happened, I felt like this because of this, yeah. is useful as a way for us to, to figure out what we're thinking. But it's a terrible sentence to say to anybody because almost everyone would say, like, don't talk to me like that. You know, stop trying to nonviolent communicate me. <laughs> but so how do we, <laughs> but, but the, the practice itself that he, he has this really uncompromising um, approach to conflict, which says it's about needs and needs are never in conflict. And if we can get down to the level of needs, then we're going to be able to figure out what to do, is his approach. And of course, there's a lot of situations where people don't feel comfortable talking about needs, and so it starts to get weird. But on some level, he's right, I think. And that's what I understood, that first workshop that I, I heard him talking, and I, I felt it. And I felt the fact that all conflict is coming out of some basic un unmet need, but that, but that our approach to how we get needs met, so the point is not that we have to have all our needs met, but that we can understand that there's a complex of needs in every conflict. Some of them are being net, n not met, some are being met. And if we can get away from being so attached to how, how we're going to get them met and step back and say, OK, I really have a need to contribute here, or to belong, or or whatever these basic needs are, that it then will be we have much more possibility to find ways to get uh, to get where we where we want to go if we're not attached to this upper level of strategy, but instead connected to needs. What's that? I think that's good insight. <clears throat> I've thought about him it a lot. Take a yeah, it, it does. It's, it really takes practice. It really does. Yeah? Um, I was just going to ask about, um, so what we were doing this activity, and um, when the question about where where we learned kind of how we should resolve mm. conflicts, and I think everyone kind of noticed how there were not many people in the sect, and be um, where we learned them in school. Yeah. Um, so do you think that doing these um, workshops, as we call them, would be beneficial in more schools and for I mean, younger people? I think there should be universal conflict resolution training, and it should start in kindergarten. And um, the, some of the most useful, because uh, I've, I've been doing some studying on what kind of training, because you know, obviously there's a lot of work that people are doing, but it tends to be kind of haphazard, more like workshops, and you know, it's not built in, and the teachers aren't trained in it, and so then it's awkward, and. Um, what I've, what I've learned is that when they build it into the curriculum itself, so it's not just that we sit down and practice learning how to not hear attack or speak to each other in a useful way, but that kids get used to thinking almost systemically about um, what creates conflict, how, what alternatives are, ways that we can think about each other when we're in conflict. Um, I think that I, that's what, actually, that's one of my overarching questions. Can we reduce the amount of violence in the world, and what would it take? And I think that's one of the things it would take. And I'm, I'm very curious about what it would take to um, develop some kind of a, a training that, that wasn't um, s stiff, and that, so that didn't get imposed on teachers, because teachers already have so much to do, you know, how that they feel. Then they also become responsible for training kids in conflict resolution. But somewhere, there's got to be some kind of a um, some kind of a way 
that kids can receive this information uh, on an ongoing, steady way over time. Yeah. I don't know what it is yet, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try to find out. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So I have one more question. So um, as we uh, mentioned earlier, so uh, a lot of people agree that religions uh, are really important to our life. And I'm just curious, so um, as like ISIS, for example, so I think there's a huge conflict about the like, views between like, ISIS and the rest mm. of the world, and which we are really attacking like, other kinds of people and often get caught in this common like, big problem. Mm -hmm. So like, as this kind of like, radical action, do you think it's still uh, practical or like, helpful by using like, the concept you mentioned earlier, like, changing our direction of thinking and not just hearing about like, attacking? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to be like, a big problem? Mm. So the question is, what about really serious situations like ISIS? Is it possible to use these, this kind of thinking to uh, bring about change in those situations? So I think what we can say for sure is that sticking with the adversarial approach has not changed anything. I mean, for sure we know that. It's, it hasn't, nothing has changed over the last thousands of years. And the, the basic level, so the, what question was, is, it, is this idea, for example, of thinking about needs, like approaching it radically, is that going to do anything? Any solution in a conflict that's going to work has to meet needs on both sides. No matter whether, you know, whether we think the people who are perpetrating from ISIS um, are completely wrong or not, they're doing it for some reason. And I'm certainly not saying you know, they're justified in doing it, but they're, they're not just doing it randomly. Some need is underneath there. And whatever solution is going to help this situation, and it, we might need to really step back systemically, and it might not be right in here, but it might be in a further, in a bigger system to say, how is this system creating this kind of response? You know, does it, does it hark back to the U.S.'s response to 9-11? Is it what, where did this all come from, and what needs to change? So I think there's a lot of the, a lot of the responses too local um, in the thinking. And these are huge questions. And I think it's a great question, and you should keep asking it. You know, how can, how can the way I think about conflict, how does it affect my community? How does the way my community thinks about conflict affect the nation? How is the way the, this nation is affecting the world? Because it can be so overwhelming that we just give up and say, well, pff, I mean, there's always been war, so whatever, that's how it is. But we don't know if that's true. And so we're not doomed, is what I think. We have, we have power, much more power to change than we, than we access, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, we had, so there's some lovely. Anybody else? Anybody else have another thought? Um, I just have a quick question. Yes. <laughs> um, I think I, because you mentioned earlier, you um, came to North Face Kingdom like, um, before. Yeah. So uh, I'm in this for as class, and I don't really know how to dress with each other, and how did she bring you to a jumping outfit? Uh, well, so I am. The question was, how did I yeah. meet Marianne, right? Yeah. I think you, sh I think you called us, right? Somehow, yeah. That you were living in the neighborhood, so I, oh, right. to, I and I recognize the names, and I want the best for St. John's Berry Academy. And so I looked at the telephone books and saw one William Forsythe in Kirby, but I don't know why it didn't occur to me it could be their William. So I thought, oh goodness, and so I started calling other towns I thought it was St. Johnsbury. And I ended up realizing the only William Forsyth was this and, and William Forsyth. So I thought probably it's a coincidence, but I'll call and leave a message and your brother called back. And my so brother said, called back. Your brother called back, thank God, to say yes, I have the right William Forsyth. And then and then Bill emailed me. And then he he and I met and then later on you and I met. Yeah, it turns out there's a big dance community, as we mentioned before, up here. I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it because we'd been coming for 20 years, but mostly we would come on a break and not be connected to the community. So it was lovely to start to realize that there's this, uh, also this community of artists up here, and um, yeah, so that's how we met. 
So there's a beautiful spread out in front. I'd like to invite everybody to come and have some tasty bits. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here. <laughs>